minimize and keep open. And let's start our presentation. So we left off with universal donors. Um, a good chunk of you have gone through your labs for the week already. Um, just to reiterate, when you're donating blood to somebody, it's really important that the recipient does not get any new antigens in their bodies. So when you go O negative, O negative is the universal donor because it's, that blood type is lacking the antigens. It doesn't have the A antigen, the B antigen, or the rhesus factor antigen. Um, the issue with donating O blood types or O negative blood type um, is that a patient or an individual that has O negative blood will have antibodies for the A antigen, antibodies for the B antigen, and potentially antibodies for the rhesus factor antigen. So because this person, this donor with O negative blood is naturally producing a bunch of antibodies, and you don't want to introduce those antibodies to the recipient's bloodstream, we take the time, we being you know, the medical community, take the time to spin down the blood so that we only donate red blood cells, or mostly red blood cells, and we minimize the number of antibodies that we're donating during the blood donation processes. On the flip side, if the rule of thumb is don't give the recipient anything new, um, if the recipient already has all three antigens, A, B, and B, factor, they're AB positive, that recipient is the universal recipient. You don't have to worry about giving them an incompatible blood type. So it really depends on what kind of a person you are. If you're altruistic, you want to have O negative. If you're a little bit more egotistic, you want to have AB positive. Let's talk about pregnancies. Um, this is going to be one of those slides where there's just a picture, and I'm going to talk a lot about a picture. Um, blood types and pregnancies are a very big deal. Um, there used to be a lot more miscarriages or stillborn births in the United States than there are today. And the reason for this is because of the hemolytic disease of newborns. If mom has a negative blood type, baby, we'll say baby number one, has a positive blood type, during the birthing process, baby's blood mixes with mom's blood. Just a little bit of blood will always mix. There's a little commingling. And then baby will introduce a positive blood type into mom's circulatory system. And mom's circulatory system now has a new antigen being introduced, and her circulatory system understandably freaks out. Her immune system goes, whoa, and starts to make lots of antibodies that attack the rhesus factor antigen, or that positive blood type antigen. And this particular kind of antibody um, IgG or immunoglobulin G is the smallest kind and can cross the placental barrier and go from mom's bloodstream into the baby's bloodstream. Now for baby number one, the very first baby that was born, it's not a problem. The ba during the birthing process, the baby's blood mixes with mom's but the baby and no harm, no foul. That first baby's going to be totally fine. It's the next baby that has the problem. Because for the next baby that has a negative blood type, excuse me, a positive blood type, mom's immune system is now producing immunoglobulins that attack the rhesus factor. And those immunoglobulins will cross the placenta barrier and attack the blood of the subsequent children while the children are in utero. And as those immunoglobulins infiltrate the child's bloodstream, it's going to cause those red blood cells to lice. That little kid will have lots of clotting, or excuse me, clumping of their blood in their developing circulatory system. And their circulatory system tries to compensate. You, as you can imagine, if you're in utero and your your mother's immune system, that's not a good thing. Um, and to compensate, the regulates red blood cell production. And instead of spending three to five days in the red blood cell, that baby shortens the amount of time that they spend making a red blood cell. And those red blood cells are dumped into the bloodstream before they're fully mature. So there's a couple things you can look at physiologically to conclusively say, yes, this child has hemolytic disease. Um, 
the biggest indicator is if that child has nucleated erythrocytes. Red blood cells or erythrocytes are not supposed to have nuclei. During the developmental process of the red blood cell, the nuclei are removed from the red blood cell and then anucleated or red blood cells without nuclei are dumped into the bloodstream to carry oxygen on that hemoglobin. But if we're speeding up and rushing the of these red blood cells, the child is going to have nucleated red blood cells in his or her bloodstream. So what do we do? I mean, because, you know, lots of women have negative blood types. Um, so how can we get around this problem? The best way to get around this problem is to prevent mom's immune system from reacting with the rhesus factor. So this is a standard practice now in developed countries. If a woman is pregnant and goes in for the pregnancy exam, one of the very first things that is done is the woman has her blood type tested. And if she has a negative blood type, I believe it's three times throughout the pregnancy, she's injected with a shot called Rogam, which um, derives its name from the rhesus factor. Rogam is a shot of antibodies that will make it so that her immune system doesn't respond to the baby's blood type. Um, the particular kind of antibodies that are being injected into the mom's immune system will bind to the rhesus factor and deactivate the rhesus factor, but they're a little bit larger. They're not small enough that they can cross over the placental barrier. And by injecting mom with antibodies that neutralize the rhesus factor, mom's immune system never is sensitized to the rhesus factor. We prevent exposure. And then baby number two, baby number three, subsequent babies will not be attacked by mom's immune system. Um, some of you, particularly if you've taken genetics, have thought, maybe are thinking in the back of your head, but yeah, what if dad has a negative blood type? If mom is negative and dad is negative, genetically the baby can't have a positive blood type. So why do we still give mom the Rogam shot if dad is also negative? And the answer for that is sometimes mom doesn't know who the father is. So we play it safe and always give mothers with negative blood types the Rogam shot as opposed to asking a lot of awkward questions. Because really, it's very, very cheap and it's a lot nicer than having a stillborn child. So we have a review question. This is how I won the lecture last Tuesday. We need to figure out who the donor and recipients would be. If we have donors, for instance, donor one has blood type AB negative, who can receive that blood from donor one? The red, green, or blue recipient. Um, there is some blood types could potentially have two correct answers. For instance, O negative is the universal donor. So theoretically, O negative could go to any recipient, but you have to use the process of elimination on this question. In order to answer everything correctly, there's only one correct answer or only one correct match. This is kind of a tough question. I'm gonna give you some you know, I'll give you 30 more seconds. Talk to each other if you need to. Down to 10 seconds. Make sure you submit your answer. All right, and I'll close the question. Do I have the ability to scribble on a question? Apparently not. Let's go back to the question. Uh, start question and close question. Let's talk through this. 
donor one, actually let's talk through donor three first. Donor three is the universal donor. So donor three can go to any of the recipients. Donor one has A, B negative for their blood type. The rule of thumb is never give the recipient a new antigen. Donor one has two antigens in their bloodstream, the A antigen and the B antigen. And there's only one recipient that has both the A antigen and the B antigen already. That's recipient red. The red recipient has blood type AB positive. They are the universal recipient. So donor one will pair with recip the red recipient. If we look at donor two, donor two is B negative. So theoretically, donor two could be donated to the blue recipient or the red recipient. But since we've already used up the red recipient, pairing them with donor one, we'll take donor two and pair them with the blue recipient. And then that leaves donor three, who theoretically could go to anyone. But the green recipient has O positive blood. So if we think of that green recipient, they do not have an A antigen. They do not have a B antigen, but they do have a rhesus factor antigen. The only blood types that can be donated to the green recipient are O negative or O positive. So let's see how we did. Hmm. Nicely done, guys, gals. Good work. So let's talk about leukocytes. Moving on. Enough about blood cell, red blood cells. Let's talk about the white blood cells. So when we think of a leukocyte or a white blood cell, these are the rarest. When you look at the hematocrit, they're typically one to less than 1% of total blood volume. And as we look at these white blood cells, their primary function is to protect us, primarily against infection from bacteria and viruses, and to a lesser degree, multicellular parasites. A key thing that you've probably noticed during the lab as you look at these leukocytes is they have a big fat nucleus in them. And the nucleus is on your microscope slides stained dark purple. So as we're looking at these leukocytes or white blood cells, the nucleus is a key component for differentiating them from the erythrocytes and the thrombocytes. And these leukocytes don't spend that much time in the bloodstream. They're primarily gonna be either in a storage organ like the spleen or the thymus or potentially the lymph node. And then when an infection is detected, they'll get into the bloodstream, travel to the site of infection, and get out of the bloodstream to actually get to the tissue that's being actively infected. It's kind of like, you know, when you go for a drive. You kind of hang out at your location, then you get on the interstate system, you go really fast for a little bit, and then you take the off-ramp and take the slow country roads. Now, because our leukocytes have a nucleus, they're going to have organelles that use that nucleus, that use the genetic code. So they're gonna have the ribosomes, they're gonna have the mitochondria, and in particular, white blood cells or leukocytes are gonna have lysosomes. They have a ton of lysosomes. Think back to last semester. A lysosome is the quote unquote recycling center of the cell. It's going to be an uh, organelle that function is to destroy something inside of the cell. So if these white blood cells are phagocytizing or engulfing pathogens, they don't want the pathogen to just hang out and it's intracellular region, they want to destroy the pathogen, and they typically are going to destroy that pathogen with those lysosomes. All white blood cells have granules, but we can't see the granules in all white blood cells. The white blood cells that you can typically see granules with a light microscope on are called the granule sites. Those granule sites are threefold. All granule sites, if you look at the name of the granule site, has fill at the end of the name. So the neutrophil, basophil, and eosinophils are gonna be the granule sites. And as we look at these granule sites, we'll see some pictures in just a little bit. The neutrophil granules are barely visible. For those of you who had lab already, you probably noticed that realistically, most people don't see them, myself included. Uh, the key characteristic of the neutrophil is the three to five lobe nucleus. When we look at the eosinophil, they have the bilobe nucleus with orangish, pink, rosy orange, dark red, depending on how strong the staining was. 
they have some kind of a red pigmentation to their granules. And then there's the basal fills, which are the most difficult to find, although my Tuesday lab sections found a ton of basal fills. I was super jealous about that. As we look at those basal fills, they have dark violet or dark purple granules. And those dark purple granules make it hard to see the dark purple nucleus. So if you find a leukocyte that appears to be a giant blob of dark purple with speckles of light purple and dark purple in it, it's probably going to be a basal fill. And we also have A granule sites, the without granules, and those are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. And we'll just look at some pictures because that's worth a thousand words. So when we look at the neutrophils, our neutrophils are the most common white blood cell. They are going to aggressively attack bacteria or phagocytized bacteria. Um, when you were in middle school and had started popping whiteheads and there's a little bit of pus on your face from all that acne, the white part of the whitehead was dead neutrophils. When we look at neutrophils, we can see the multiple lobe nuclei present in these neutrophils. So three to five lobes per nucleus. And you can see a little bit of speckling in the cytoplasm, but not that much. And they're typically going to be larger than the erythrocyte. If somebody has neutrophils, that's just going to be abnormally high concentrations of neutrophils. And that's a very normal, very healthy thing. When we're fighting a bacterial infection, we're going to upregulate the number of neutrophils to help combat those bacteria. We also have eosinophils and basophils. When you think of eosinophils, characteristically, or when we think of the structure of an eosinophil, I really want you to focus on the fact that the eosinophils have that bilobe nuclei and lots of pink granules in the cytoplasm. In terms of the function of eosinophils, um, the thing that most people fixate on, myself included, um, is that eosinophils help you to remove um, multicellular parasitic infections. Um, if you really wanted to be pedant pedantic in mince words, all bacterial infections are parasitic infections because it's an organism that benefits from the host and harms the host at the same time. So when we say parasitic infections in eosinophils, I want you to think of multicellular parasitic infections or protozoal parasitic infections. Those are going to be associated with the eosinophils. Um, to a lesser degree, we can have some diseases of the collagen or diseases of the spleen or allergies, but overwhelmingly think parasitic infections. They are going to be a larger leukocyte because they need to have a lot of lysosomes to destroy those large multicellular parasites. When we look at basophils, the rarest number, or excuse me, the rarest kind of leukocyte, those basophils are going to oftentimes be associated with mediating the inflammation response or the inflammatory response. As we look at the basophils, they are going to release histamine. Histamine is a chemical and neurotransmitter that dilates the blood vessels, makes the blood vessels get bigger and leakier so that the tissue becomes swollen with extracellular fluid and gets a red pigmentation because of increased blood supply. So when we think of situations where we have lots of inflammation, um, such as the poxes in chicken pox or the itis for sinitis, think of inflammation there. Think of lots of basophils. Basophils are also going to secrete heparin, which is one of multiple anticoagulants. By reducing the rate of coagulation, we allow for more neutrophils, more monocytes, we allow for the other white blood cells to be delivered to the area. Think of it like this. Heparin reduces the traffic jams. It clears the blood vessels of those blockages so that the other white blood cells, the other leukocytes, can get delivered to where they need to go. We also have some A granule sites. The smallest leukocyte and most common A granule site is the lymphocyte. The lymphocyte um, 
is derived from the fact that it's highly involved with lymph nodes, hence the name lymphocyte. And lymphocytes are kind of essential to our immune system, particularly our adaptive immunity. We'll talk more about that when we get to the chapter on the immune system. Our lymphocytes can differentiate into many different kinds of cells. Some of the cells they differentiate into are going to focus on bacterial infections. Some are going to focus on destroying cancer cells. Some are going to focus on destroying human cells that are infected with viruses. Some of these lymphocytes will differentiate into other cell types that give us our immune memory. So if we get a vaccine, a lymphocyte derivative is what gives us the immune memory associated with the vaccine. Lymphocytes are also going to be used to coordinate the immune response. Um, so our lymphocytes do many different things once they're activated. The thing that I need to emphasize to you is that lymphocytes specialize in destroying human cells. And this is a big, big concept. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive because normally as a human being, you want more human cells. So the idea of your body destroying itself, at least on the surface, is kind of you know, confusing. Why would you destroy yourself? And the idea behind this is triage, or the lesser of two evils. If one of your human cells is infected with a virus, you can either destroy that human cell right away before the virus reproduces and infects other cells, or you can let that human cell wallow in its misery have more viruses reproduce inside of it, and then spread the infection to other human cells. So the idea behind the, this is that we destroy the human cell before it causes other human cells to malfunction. Now in a perfect world, lymphocytes are only going to destroy human cells that are infected with a virus or that are precancerous. Um, when lymphocytes malfunction, one of the malfunctions associated with lymphocytes is cancer the growth of cancerous tumors. And right now, the hottest area of research for cancer treatment is with the immune system. If you want to be a cancer researcher right now, you need to get a degree or specialty in immunology because that's where all the research dollars are being poured right now. Taking those lymphocytes and some of the natural killer cells and retraining them, reteaching them to kill the cancerous human cells. Let's talk monocytes. Monocytes are the largest leukocyte. Um, they're the big guys. Notice how big the monocyte is relative to the, eos, excuse me, relative to the erythrocytes that are present in the photomicrograph. Our monocytes also are going to have a C-shaped nuclei. The reason our monocytes are so big is they specialize in phagocytizing pathogens. The specialty of the monocyte is swallowing other cells. And if it's going to eat other cells, it has to be bigger than the other cells it's consuming. Um, if you like horror movies from the 1950s and 1960s, there's the classic, The Blob, um, where a giant gelatinous mass consumes an entire town. Um, you can think of the monocyte as The Blob. It's the big one that eats everything. And what I really like about the monocyte, and I think it's kind of cool, is that after it consumes um, the pathogen, it chops up the pathogen and then takes little bits and pieces of that pathogen and decorates the surface of its cell membrane with bits and pieces of what it just ate. There's a special term for this. It's called presenting. It is an antigen presenting cell. It takes little antigens or little molecules that can trigger an immune response from the pathogen and decorates its cell membrane with those antigens to help activate other cells of the immune system. We'll talk more about antigen presenting cells when we get to the immune system. If we have too many white blood cells, that is known as, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. The production of white blood cells is leukopoiesis. So when we think of hemopoiesis, that's an umbrella term that means the production of blood. Erythropoiesis is the production of erythrocytes. Leukopoiesis is the production of leukocytes. And as we have this process occurring, there are multiple cell lines involved. The hemocytoblasts 
will differentiate into myeloblast, monoblast, and lymphoblast. And these three intermediates will then form the five primary leukocytes. The myeloblasts will form the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Monoblasts, well, build monocytes. It's a monocyte building cell. And a lymphoblast builds lymphocytes. Recall that suffix blast means to create or to build. I always like to think blasts build. Now, in terms of where this occurs, most leukopoiesis is going to occur within the red bone marrow. There's a little tiny bit that occurs in some other organs when we're very young, but overwhelmingly it's the red bone marrow. When a, somebody has leukemia or a cancer of the white blood cells, one of the standard methods of treatment is to destroy all of the hemocytoblasts in that patient's red bone marrow. They completely blast the red bone marrow with chemotherapy and radiation so that those cancerous cells stop they're dead, and then they stop making inappropriate white blood cells. And during that period of time, the patient is very immunocompromised. They don't have any more white blood cells in their body, and they have to be very careful about getting infections. And then after destroying the patient's white blood cells, or, or red bone marrow, then to recolonize their spongy bone tissue with non-cancerous red bone marrow. And that's where the bone marrow transplants come in. So as we look at the life cycle of a typical white blood cell or leukocyte, granulocytes d don't spend a lot of time in the bloodstream. They can be in the bloodstream for as little as eight hours. So they pretty much are made and then immediately go to the site that they're needed. They also have a shorter lifespan. These granulocytes start to die off after about five days. We make them, we use them, and then they're, we move on. Um, a lot of these granule sites are designed to destroy themselves while they are destroying the pathogen. Um, you can think of them as kind of like kamikaze pilots from World War II. The process of destroying the pathogen also destroys the granule site. Now when we look at the A granule sites, the monocytes and lymphocytes, they're going to last much longer. They are not the kamikaze pilots, so to speak. Monocytes can exit the bloodstream in about 20 hours. Then they are activated and turned into the big eater or the macrophage. And then they can last for a while, several years. And then we have the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes, can, when activated, can last a lifetime, depending on how they're activated and when in your life cycle they're activated. They last for a very long time. Um, these lymphocytes, just to say this again, are the cells that give you immune memories. Differentiated lymphocytes are what give your immune system the immune memory that you get from vaccination or exposure to a disease. Now, if somebody's bleeding, um, that's not a good thing. You know, as a rule of thumb, we don't want to lose blood. The process of making it so that we stop bleeding is called hemostasis. The process of bleeding is called hemorrhage. Hemo is that root word, or heme, um, refers to blood. Stasis means stationary. We want to make the amount of blood loss in our body become stationary or static. We don't want to lose any more blood. Um, you can think of your bloodstream as kind of like a plumbing system. You know, we have pipes, we have a pump to pressurize it. We circulate a liquid. And if the liquid is leaking out of the plumbing system, your plumbing system starts to malfunction and lots of things will go wrong. Now, when we look at hemostasis, um, it really is very similar to what plumbers do um, to stop a leaky pipe in your house. You can have a vascular spasm, which is going to make the pipe opening smaller so that less blood can flow through it. So when we think of vascular spasms, I want you to think of smaller diameter, or reducing the diameter of the blood vessel. Smaller pipes will lose less liquid. We can also have a platelet plug formation. This platelet plug formation is going to be scab formation. This is kind of like taking flex tape or duct tape and wrapping it around a leaky pipe. 
And then you can also have blood clotting itself. This occurs inside of the pipe, and it's going to be a coagulation of the blood. And as we look at these processes, the vascular spasm, platelet plugs, and blood clotting, all of these are going to depend on thrombocytes or platelets. Those platelets are involved with all of these mechanisms. So let's talk about the thrombocytes. Uh, thrombocytes or platelets, you know, depending on who you ask, they are a cell, they are not a cell, you know, it's, these are one of those cell lines that's kind of a gray area, kind of like viruses. There's a lot of debate about is a virus an organism, is it not an organism, does it meet the criteria, does it not meet the criteria. Same thing with thrombocytes. There is some debate about whether or not they are truly a cell. I tend to err on the side of calling them cells because they have the site suffix in them. Now, how do we make a thrombocyte? We have enormous cells in our body called megakaryocytes. Um, to give you an idea of how big a megakaryocyte is, it's pretty dang large. And for reference, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a erythrocyte on the slide. So let's look at the figure down below because it's a little bit clearer. Here's a erythrocyte. Here's a neutrophil. Here's a megakaryocyte. It's enormous. It's one of the largest human cell types in existence. And what ends up happening with the megakaryocyte is that it will extend a pseudopod into a blood capillary. And that pseudopod that's extended into the blood capillary starts to disintegrate and fragment. And those little individual fragments of the megakaryocyte pseudopod are called thrombocytes. So we have a big fat megakaryocyte. It will squirt parts of itself into the bloodstream, and those little chunks that fragment off are the thrombocytes. Now, when we look at platelets, they, by volume, make up the least amount of our blood. They don't make up much of our blood. For those of you who've been to lab already, you've noticed that the platelets on the microscope slides are super duper tiny. Question, comment? Thrombocytes do have a cell membrane on them. So what do, vas what do our thrombocytes or platelets do? They help us with vasoconstriction. They stimulate the contraction of the smooth muscle in our blood cells so that we have less blood loss. Thrombocytes or, or platelets stick together to form platelet plugs. They are also going to re release chemicals that promote blood clotting. Another thing that our thrombocytes are going to do, another chemical cascade they initiate, they initiate, is the inflammation cascade. And you can imagine that if you're bleeding, you probably got a cut. I mean, that doesn't take rocket science to figure that out. And if you got a cut, there's probably an easy access point for bacteria to get into your body. So one of the things that thrombocytes do is that when they are at the site of a blood leak or where we're bleeding, they are going to release chemicals that attract neutrophils and monocytes, those white blood cells that specialize in phagocytizing bacteria, particularly the neutrophils. When we think of neutrophils, think of them as kind of the first responders. And those thrombocytes are going to be so calling 911, so to speak. They're the ones that signal the neutrophils to come to the site of the bleeding or the damaged tissue. As we look at the platelets, the platelets themselves do not phagocytize the bacteria. They attract the neutrophils and monocytes to phagocytize the bacteria. And then finally, if there's been damage to a blood vessel, we need to have tissue regeneration. So another thing that the thrombocytes do is they stimulate tissue regeneration factors. They stimulate the division of those cells so that it can repair the damage to the tissue. So even though our thrombocytes are itty bitty, they do lots of very important things. So let's have a review question. I'm gonna give you 
a little bit longer for this one. Let's go a minute and a half. Match the blood cell with the function. We've talked about a bunch of blood cell types. Please match them with their function. You guys are awfully quiet. I would be talking to my classmate if I was doing a question like this right now. We have about 40 seconds left. Ten seconds. Make sure you submit your answers. All right, and we are done. So, guys, gals, um, hopefully you were able to match erythrocyte with transporting oxygen gas. Red blood cells have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin moves oxygen gas. When we think of thrombocytes, thrombocytes will cause hemostasis. They help us to not lose blood. When we think of eosinophils, I want you to really focus on the that how eosinophils will fight parasitic infections. Um, for the basophil matching, I intentionally used a phrase that was not spelled out on your PowerPoint slide. On your PowerPoint slide, I listed all the symptoms or um, the effects of the inflammatory response, but I only said inflammatory response verbally, and I intentionally said inflammatory response multiple times. And I did that because I want you to learn to write down things that your instructors say. When the instructor repeats themselves in class, that means it's probably really important. So. Just because it's not a fill in the blank, make sure you still write it down if I say it in class. When we think of the neutrophils, that's going to focus on phagocytizing bacteria. The leukocytes are the quarterback or coordinator of the immune system. And monocytes become macrophages. Question, comment in the back. Um, so I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear. The question was during anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, liquid leaves the bloodstream, so the blood is going to be, be dilated, blood vessels are dilated. Do platelets help to reduce the loss of blood during anaphylaxis? And right now I'm just going to be very honest, I'm not sure. My inclination is no, because anaphylaxis is regulated by basophils and basophils are going to actively secrete anticoagulants, but I'm not 100% sure. Let's talk about making platelets. Erythropoiesis is making erythrocytes, leukopoiesis is making leukocytes, and thrombopoiesis is the process of making thrombocytes. The megakaryoblast is the cell line that produces the platelets. The hormone that stimulates the production of platelets 
is called thrombopoietin. Just like erythropoietin stimulates erythropoiesis and leukopoietin stimulates leukopoiesis, we have thrombopoietin stimulating thrombopoiesis. Um, I can't emphasize enough how ginormous the megakaryocytes are. They are many times the surface or the volume of a red blood cell. Megakaryocytes approach the size of a human egg cell. If you have really good eyes, you could maybe see a megakaryocyte with your naked eye. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I spent a lot of time working with Arabidopsis, or little, basically little, little tiny weeds that grew in the field. And I would dissect out the nectaries, and they were 200 microns in diameter, and I could just barely see that with my naked eyes. Um, but someone with better eyes could maybe see something 100 microns in diameter. When we look at those platelets, platelets don't last a very long time. If you think of a platelet, it's um, a fragment of a larger cell, and it doesn't have the mechanisms that it needs to maintain itself. They're anucleated, they don't have a lot of organelles, if any organelles, and they die off very quickly. So let's talk about the process of hemostasis, or the process of stopping the loss of blood. Step one during hemostasis is the vascular spasm. We're going to make it so that we constrict the tunica media or the smooth muscle layer of our blood vessels. And during that process, we are going to have a smaller tube and we'll lose less blood to that smaller tube. What can trigger the vascular spasm? Well, sometimes if we have an owie, the sensation of pain triggers the vascular spasm. Something else that can trigger the vascular spasm is injury to smooth muscle. When smooth muscle is damaged, that's kind of like saying you've sliced through a blood vessel. All blood vessels will have some smooth muscles associated with them. We also could have the presence of serotonin. If platelets are activated, when activated, they release the neurotransmitter serotonin. It's also going to act like a vasoconstrictor if it's present in the bloodstream. So what happens during vasoconstriction, or what are the effects? Um, the big one is that the, the blood vessel becomes constricted. Our pain receptors um, cause vasoconstriction during the short term. Think of the last time you got a paper cut. It hurts a lot right away, but after a couple of minutes, it stops hurting, or at least it doesn't hurt as much. Um, the smooth muscle injury, though, is going to cause longer duration vasoconstriction because that smooth muscle is going to continue spilling cytoplasm into the extracellular tissues or extracellular liquid, so we're going to continue to have vasoconstriction triggered by smooth muscle damage. Now, if we have vasoconstriction, the, the tube gets smaller, we lose less blood, but we're still losing blood. Vasoconstriction does not stop the loss of blood, it just slows it down. It's a, a temporary stopgap for the other stuff to kick in. And we are particularly interested in blood clotting. We use blood clotting to stop the loss of blood. Vasoconstriction just slows down the loss of blood and gives us time to clot. So as we look at the platelet plug, that platelet plug is going to initially clog up the opening. As we look at the inner lining of our blood vessels, um, the tunica intima, the inner lining of the blood vessel has a lot of collagen holding the simple squamous cells together. And when that inner lining is torn, we have fragments of collagen being exposed to the bloodstream. Those loose ends of collagen are going to chemically attract and activate thrombocytes. So when we have exposed collagen in somebody's blood vessels, that triggers the formation of the platelet plug. To have that exposed collagen, we need to tear or rip the inner lining of the blood vessels. 
Now as we're looking at this process, the platelet plugs are going to have, or the platelets themselves, the, th the thrombocytes themselves, have very small pseudopods, or very small extensions. And those very small pseudopods will contract. You could think of a platelet plug as kind of like a game of Red Rover, Red Rover, come right over. Um, are we old enough that we played that game in elementary school? Okay, okay, so it's like they link arms, first they hold hands and then they contract and they pull themselves together, just like the platelets in the platelet plug. And as those platelets degranulate or release their stored chemicals, they are going to release the serotonin to act as a vasoconstrictor. Um, the <coughs> process of contracting is an active process that turns ATP into a DP. That ADP is then going to trigger the attraction of more platelets. And then there's some other chemicals at play here. Um, for instance, we have thromboxin A2. Thromboxin A2 is a chemical that falls into the category of an eicosanoid. And this chemical, thromboxin A2, is one of the chemicals of the blood clotting cascades. Something that's worth emphasizing is platelet plug formation is a positive feedback loop. It's one of the very few positive feedback loops in the body. Most feedback loops in our body are negative feedback loops. They help to maintain homeostasis keeping us at the chemical set point. Um, the platelet plug formation is a positive feedback loop. Once you start making a platelet plug, that accelerates the process of making more platelet plugs, and that attracts even more platelets, so the platelet plug gets bigger and bigger and bigger. These positive feedback loops for me personally are kind of scary in a chemical sense because they can spiral out of control very rapidly. Um, you know, just to give you some personal history, um, my grandfather, my grandpa Eddie, my dad, and two of my siblings um, inherited a defective allele that helped to downregulate this platelet plug formation. So, constantly blood clotting, get out of control in his body after a cow kicked him. Um, and then my father and two of my siblings had blood clots form in their legs while they were on an airplane ride and those turned into pulmonary embolisms for them. And somebody, teenagers should not get pulmonary embolisms. Um, this positive feedback process is hard to downplay and downregulate in human beings. And then finally, step three, coagulation. During this coagulation process, we are going to form a liquid tight barrier. This coagulation process is going to involve several chemical cascades. Um, we are going to take a protein that's floating in our blood plasma called fibrinogen. This is the protein we talk about in the lab that contributes to the Rouleau formation during PhysioX activity number two, for those of you who have done lab. And that fibrinogen, when activated, turns into a protein called fibrin. Fibrin is fibrous. It's a fibrous protein that for lack of a better analogy, looks like microscopic cheesecloth when it forms a fibrin mesh. And this fibrin mesh, or this microscopic cheesecloth, is going to red blood cells get stuck in it. A common question students ask me is, what's the difference between platelet formation and coagulation? And there's a couple key differences we're gonna emphasize. First, let's go back a slide, platelet plugs are made of just the thrombocytes. When we have coagulation, that fibrin mesh is going to trap erythrocytes and recruit erythrocytes to help prevent the flow of blood or the loss of blood. So there's different cell types. Coagulation involves thrombocytes and erythrocytes. Platelet plug formation is only thrombocytes. Another key difference is the formation of the fibrin mesh, or this coagulation pathway. During coagulation, we activate fi fibrinogen and turn it into fibrin. There is no activation of fibrinogen during the platelet plug formation. 
And as we look at these two pathways, we have an extrinsic pathway and an intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is going to be triggered by something outside of the blood. Extrinsic pathways are triggered from something outside or external to the blood. Intrinsic pathways are going to be triggered by something inside of the blood. So when we think of an extrinsic pathway, we're typically going to have some kind of a gross damage or slice. So you can take a razor blade from outside of the bloodstream, slice the blood vessel, that triggers the extrinsic pathway. Uh, in my family, we have a problem with inappropriate activation of the intrinsic pathway. We could be, my brothers were just chilling, they didn't have a cut, and they started having blood clots form because of inappropriate signals inside of their bloodstreams. Now when we think of the intrinsic versus the extrinsic pathways, um, it's kind of like these shoes, to me at least. So when we look at, let's back up a slide here, this extrinsic pathway, it's only gonna have two proteins involved. The intrinsic pathway has more proteins involved. So as we look at these shoes, the black flat to me, represents the extrinsic pathway. It's simple, it's no nonsense. Very rarely will it malfunction on you because there's not that many parts involved. And then the intrinsic pathway to me is like that's the little high heel. There's more parts involved, it's a little bit more complicated, and because there's so many more parts involved, you're much more likely to have some kind of a malfunction when using the stiletto compared to the flats. So as we look at these clotting pathways, the extrinsic pathway is going to have thromboplastin and factor seven. Those two proteins will then go to the common pathway. Our ex, or excuse me, our intrinsic pathway because there are s double the number of proteins that need to be activated, has a much more likely chance of a behaving inappropriately or malfunctioning and causing inappropriately blood clotting. Both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways will merge on what's known as the common pathway. So down here in blue, this is our common pathway. And our common pathway is going to merge at factor 10 right here, activated factor 10. On your PowerPoint slides, hopefully that worked out that that was a blank for you to fill in. Is that a blank on your slides? All right, good, cool beans. Um, included over here is the end product. We have the fibrin mesh. You can see all the little fibrin filaments that have entrapped or encapsulated erythrocytes to help within that coagulation process. Now let's talk about some common trends we see here. Um, a lot of these coagulation proteins have two names. Um, they have the fun name and the easy to remember name. The easy to remember name is the Roman numerals. Factor 12 goes to factor 11. Factor 11 goes to factor nine. Factor nine goes to factor eight. Hey, that's kind of cool. I like it when they're in relative sequential order of the blood clotting cascade. So those Roman numeral names, because they're much easier to remember in the order of activation for the blood clotting pathways, are becoming the more common names. Um, some older, old school names include calriculin, Christmas tree factor. Um, there are some really just off the wall names that are being phased out right now for these blood clotting proteins. I want you to focus primarily on the Roman numerals because that's what most textbooks are focusing on right now and it's just a lot easier to keep in mind. You, for exam purposes, focus on extr extrinsic and intrinsic and the sequence of activation. I also want to emphasize on this slide 
calcium. We need calcium ions to coagulate our blood. Now, if we don't have enough calcium, we struggle with blood clotting. If we have too much blood calcium, we have overactive blood clotting. We need blood calcium homeostasis. There was a question in common. Yeah, that's not numerical, right? If, you, if we can count backwards, 12 should go to 11, 11 should go to 10, and then after 10 there should be a 9. The reason for that is because of revisions to the blood clotting cascade. When the Roman numerals were initially instituted, we thought it was a different order of activation. That's a very good intuitive question. Why are they slightly out of sequence? Now when we look at the common pathway, guys, gals, um, the common pathway starts with factor 10. Factor 10, when exposed to factors 3 and factors 5, will all merge to become this giant complex known as the prothrombin activator. That prothrombin activator will take prothrombin and turn it into thrombin. Once thrombin is activated, thrombin will take fibrinogen and turn fibrinogen into fibrin. And once we have fibrin filaments, fibrin binds together to make the fibrin mesh, which then forms the blood clot. So just to re-emphasize this thing, the extrinsic pathway is going to be initiated by something outside of the bloodstream causing damage. And then that tissue damage is going to cause factor three or thromboplastin to be re released. And eventually, we'll go from factor 7 to 5 down to 10. So we get to the common pathway relatively quickly. Our intrinsic pathway is going to be initiated by a malfunction with our platelets, potentially, in the case of my family, or when the platelets are just going to release factor 12, formerly known as the Hegemon factor or Hagemon factor. Factor 12 goes to 11, then to 9, then to 8, then to factor 10 at the common pathway. Either pathway requires calcium 2 positive ions. So this is yet another example of why we're going to have osteoclasts breaking down our dense bone tissue to release calcium from the bone's extracellular matrix into our bloodstream. Um, this is a slide that just focuses on the reaction cascade for the intrinsic pathway. Once we get to factor 10, we go to prothrombin activator. Pro that activates prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin will take profibrinogen and turn it into fibrin, which then makes the plug. And I did not mean to pull up the HTML, my bad. So as we look at this activation of factor 10, Factor 10 activation is going to lead to the prothrombin activator. And if I back up a couple slides here, getting factor 10 activated and going to the prothrombin activator, that's going to involve factor 3, factor 5, calcium ions, and phosphorus. Um, ferride, or PF3, excuse me, not P ferride, um, it involves four different factors. So this process of going from factor 10 to the prothrombin activator is relatively complicated, and that involves lots of key players moving together. And I'll say it again, once we have the prothrombin activator, it takes prothrombin and converts it to thrombin. Prothrombin will take fibrinogen, and convert it to fibrin. And then fibrin makes the mesh or the polymer. And then we make the mesh that holds the red blood cells in place, or the erythrocytes in our bloodstream. As we look at thrombin, once we have thrombin produced by this prothrombin activator, thrombin causes us to make more prothrombin activator. I'll back up a couple slides here and clear us again. Once we have thrombin produced by the prothrombin activator, 
thrombin makes it so we make more prothrombin activator. This is one of the key steps of the positive feedback loop. The end result causes more of what is triggering the end result. Let's talk about how we get rid of blood clots. Um, this process of blood clotting starts to slow down in about 30 minutes, thankfully. Otherwise, we'd have out of control clotting. Our platelets are going to release a factor, um, a growth factor, that's going to cause the inner lining of our blood vessels, the endothelial cells, to start regenerating. We're also going to start to have fibrinolysis. Lysis is a suffix or root word that refers to the destruction of. What's being destroyed? Fibrin. That fibrin mesh is going to be destroyed. So when we have fibrinolysis, we are destroying a blood clot or shrinking a blood clot. And this process of fibrinolysis is going to be triggered by a different chemical pathway. We're going to have factor 12, and that factor 12 is going to activate the formation of, or promote the formation of an enzyme called the calicrine enzyme. Calicrine is then going to take plasminogen, activate it, and make plasmin, and plasmin is the protein that directly dissolves fibrin clots or fibrin meshes. I'll say this again, this is a big take home. Plasmin is the blood protein that dissolves blood clots. That's where the action's at. So if you have somebody who is suffering from myocardial infarction, infarction or they're having some kind of inappropriate blood clotting, um, it would not necessarily be inappropriate to give them plasmin as an injection to help break up the clot. It's a clot bluster. Plasmin is not always used, but it's occasionally used to help destroy blood clots in human beings that should not be there. So to show us this process in diagram form, factor 12 helps us to produce calicrine. Calicrine will take, activate plasminogen to plasmin, and then plasmin will break up the blood clots. Um, as we're looking at a normal, healthy blood vessel, the platelets in that blood vessel do not stick to the inner lining of the blood vessel when everything's working correctly. The inner lining of the blood vessel is very smooth, very slippery. Uh, Miss Laundrich and I ordered a couple hearts, um, pig hearts, two weeks ago. And knock on wood, they'll be here in time for you to feel the inner lining and how slippery it is next week during lab. Because um, it's really amazingly slippery because we don't want those platelets sticking to the inner lining of the blood. So we don't want that inappropriate clotting. We're also going to have some natural anti-clotting agents. Basophils release heparin. We also are going to have an antithrombin factor released from our livers. Other organisms um, will also release anti-clotting factors. These are typically organisms that eat or consume our blood. They don't want the blood to clot while they're consuming our blood. We'll talk about those in a little bit. If we don't have enough blood clotting factors or something's wrong with our blood clotting factors, we bleed too much. And that can lead to a disease known as hemophilia. There are variations of hemophilia. It's genetically linked. Most high school textbooks talk about um, some of the Russian royal families and how there's an excellent case study done about how they had a bleeding disease associated within some of the Russian royal families back when they had the czars in Russia. This disease is sex linked on the y X chromosome, but thankfully it's recessive. So for those of you who've taken genetics, you know recessive X linked chromosome diseases, generally speaking, will manifest themselves in males because they have only one X chromosome. Females typically have two X chromosomes and they'll usually have a good one that can mask the effects of that recessive disease. There are variations of hemophilia depending on which clotting factor is malfunctioning. If somebody has hemophilia A, it's one of the worst ones. Physical activity can trigger bleeding. Individuals with hemophilia A understandably have dramatically shortened lifespans because if you have 
bleeding occurring whenever you get bumped or dinged, um, that's not good for your body. Someone with hemophilia A could have hand-shaped bruises on their bodies from a hug, potentially. Um, if they get bonked in the head, they could have a subdural hematoma occur. Um, individuals with hemophilia A need to get lots of blood plasma transfusions so they can have appropriate clotting factors in their bloodstream and give them a more vibrant life. When we think of a hematoma, I want you to think of a giant, just pick that blood clot in the extracellular space or in the interstitial fluid of the tissues. Common name for a hematoma is bruise. If you can see it on the surface of the body, we call it a bruise. If you can't see it on the surface, it's just a big blood clot or bruise that you don't see on the surface. Now, if we have thrombosis, this is a special kind of clotting associated with the activation of the intrinsic pathway when it should not be activated. The blood clot that initially forms is a thrombus. Thrombi are a blood clot that form in one spot and stay in one spot. Thrombi are most likely to form in the large veins of the lower leg, uh, particularly if you've been remain, if you've been seating or seat, um, if you've been sitting for a long time and had blood flow pinched off. So the classic examples involve airplane flights because you're cramped in a tiny seat and it digs into the back of your thigh and impinges blood flow with the large veins of the, th the lower leg. Once that initial embolus, excuse me, thrombus starts to move around, once that initial blood clot starts to move around, we've renamed it. A thrombus on the move is an embolus. Another way of thinking of this is an embolus is a blood clot that was made somewhere else in the body. When somebody has a pulmonary embolism, it's usually from a blood clot that forms in the legs, moves through the heart, and gets stuck in the lungs. Now, during this process of having either a thrombus or an embolism, it's going to reduce blood flow, and that can cause the death of tissue if we cut off the nutrient supply. And people in the United States die annually from blood clotting is a problem in the U.S. How can we prevent blood clotting? We can prevent blood clotting if we have the appropriate amount of vitamin K. We need enough vitamin K so we can make the clotting factors. Too much vitamin K can cause inappropriate blood clotting. So this is one of those things where we need to maintain homeostasis. Too little is bad, too much is bad. If we have too little vitamin K, we can't clot our blood appropriate. Too much vitamin K causes too much blood clotting. We get our vitamin K typically from leafy greens or the E. coli in our large intestine. So the two different versions, vitamin K1 versus vitamin K2. We're also going to find that some chemicals that counteract vitamin K will reduce blood clotting. So we can have Coumadin. Um, if it's given to a human, if we put it in rat poison, we call it warfarin. Also, we look at aspirin. Aspirin is not a vitamin K suppressor, but it's going to be a th thromboxine A2 suppressant. And then there's some other suppressors that reduce the amount of coagulation. Pyridin has been isolated from medical leeches. Some snakes have a chemical compound known as avarin. And then in the Midwest, we have mosquitoes that release anticoagulants into our body while they're sucking our blood. Um, when we think of the use of medical leeches, they've fallen out of favor initially, but they're becoming more popular. And I had to include this figure because you can buy quote unquote sterile Amazonian leeches from a medical supplier, and you'll oftentimes take these medical leeches and put it on an appendage that's been sewn back onto a patient. So let's say my hand's chopped off in an accident. The doctor will sew it back on and connect the big blood vessels, but nobody 
can reconnect all the tiny little blood capillaries in my reattached appendage. So there's lots of edema of the tissue, and you need to remove that excessive blood and fluid so that you don't pinch off blood flow, and that's where the medical leeches come in. Um, when we look at this process, we can also have tissue plasminogen activator. Tissue plasminogen activator is going to cause plasmin to be activated to dissolve the blood clots. That's what blood clots are forming. And then we can also use the hematin, as I had mentioned, that's made by that giant leech. So, we have a couple minutes left in class. Three minutes are left in class. Don't pack up. We have a review question. I, this is the second time I've asked you a question like this. Um, when blood samples were drawn, an anticoagulant such as heparin or citric acid are often put in the test tube to prevent clotting. Which blood clotting pathway is this anticoagulant in the test tube blocking? And how can you know which, anti, which blood clotting pathway, the intrinsic or extrinsic, is being counteracted in the test tube? So go ahead and type your answers. Um, this is just me, for me to check your understanding. Um, as long as you answer it, you should be okay. It's not coming up. Uh, all right, let's see here. Maybe if I click reply. Post. Uh, no correct answer. It should be running. Hmm. Resume. Now it's up. Okay. You can think of this as kind of like the exit slip you have in high school where you write a sheet of paper before you leave the classroom. So I see some people saying intrinsic. Guys, gals, this is a two-part question. Which pathway and why? Don't forget the why. I wasn't sure it was allowing them to see the responses was appropriate or not. So I was like, eh, let's see how it goes. Yeah, I made sure to keep it anonymous. When you're done answering, you can head out. I'll see you on Tuesday. Son of a gun. Yeah. And since we're in the middle of this question right now, I'm just going to write down your information. So if you write down your name, first, last name, and date, and I'll make sure to mark you present. Okay. Yeah, it let me like, put in the code, but uh -huh. every time the location comes on, because you have to be like, in the classroom, yeah, yeah, yeah. it just crashes. Like, the app just crashes. Weird. So. <laughs> Attendance? Oh, okay. So my, kind of, it, he was top hat, but when I was going in to do the um, question, my computer was glitching, so I wasn't able to submit them, so it was like loading the whole mm -hmm. time, so I wasn't able to submit any of the um, clicker or top hat questions. Okay, yeah. I want you to write down your name, okay. date, and say participation questions. Okay. Thank There's you. a pen. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, so you were marked present for attendance. Yeah, but like after the first question was already asked and answered. Okay, um, at when Quinn is done, I want you to write down your name okay. and then 
first, last name, and participation questions okay. on that note card, and I'll fix it after the fact. So, were you marked present? Yeah. Okay. You think so. Check your phone. Oh, that's okay. I'll walk you through the process. 